I'd like to just introduce uh, Greg, Professor Gray Cox, uh, who's a professor of col at College of the Atlantic. Uh, and um, as you'll see in his presentation today, if you don't know him already, uh, you'll see he's very multi-talented in many, many different areas. And Gray mentioned that uh, he's willing to give future talks on this or on more specific topics related to which what he is presenting today. And uh, just mention one or two things, fond memories with, uh, I remember during one of my sabbaticals in India, Gray came over for several months and really immersed himself in India, Indian culture, the way he has in Maine, in Latin America and throughout the world. And uh, part of our share, and we spoke at many conferences in India together. And part of, we have a shared interest in Mahatma Gandhi and nonviolence. And I think a lot of this came out of uh, Gray's uh, Quaker background. Also, uh, I recall fondly, we did programs together up at the last uh, World Parliament of Religions in Toronto, where Gray had some very, very valuable presentations. So his new book, which uh, forms the basis of what he will present today is a Smarter Planet or Wiser Earth, How Dialogue Can Transform Artificial Intelligence into Collaborative Wisdom. And as was mentioned after Gray Cox's presentation, we'll have time for questions, comments, discussion. We ask that people keep it brief. You can submit things to the chat, or you can use the symbol for raising your hand, or you can raise your hand and uh, we'll do our best to recognize you. So the title of the talk today is From Smarter Planet to Wiser Earth, Re-envisioning Relationships Between AI Technologies, Human Society, and the Natural World. So uh, it's, it's a pleasure to, to turn it over now to Professor Gray Cox. Thanks, Doug. Thanks very much. Um, and thank you all for coming. This is great. It's a great turnout. And um, I'm really appreciative uh, for, the, for Orno, the University of Maine to, uh, program to be, be sharing this. And also I appreciate the, the land acknowledgement that was offered at the start here. Um, I'm grateful to the Wabnaki people for um, their contribution to, in all sorts of ways, including sort of their recent leadership on climate change and water issues and other issues and being models for, uh, for that and for community building and through ceremony and song, for example. And uh, for me, um, part of the, the Zoom movement that's been exciting is we, so many of us can gather together, but part of it that's challenging is the way in which it, it affects the way our brains work and stuff. So I, I've been trying to support a slow Zoom movement, sort of like the slow food movement, uh -huh. where we practice mindfulness to be aware of what's nutrition for our bodies or for our minds. And, and uh, I find it helpful to sort of start off talks like this, where we're going to deal with existential threats to the species and all kinds of complicated issues uh, by by a song. So if, I hope you'll bear with me. I just would like, just for, for myself, maybe it will help you as well to center a little bit. I've got a very brief song I'd like to share, okay? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> oh, oh. I'm, I'm going to slow right down. Yes. So I can get there, get there, get there, get there sooner. I'm going to, going to, going to slow right down. Yeah. So I can get there today yes i'm gonna 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 slow right down oh, 
maybe even come to a full stop. Oh, maybe if I come to a full stop, I'm gonna, gonna get there right away. Yes. Well, thanks for letting me share that. Um, and let me share now a screen, okay? Um, with a PowerPoint on it. Uh, here we go. I hope you all can see that okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to put it in the presenting mode. You see it all? It's okay? Yep. Good. Okay. So um, Doug already mentioned the title of the talk and that we've just sung the song. Let me just say a little bit about um, an outline for it. Um, I want to, just by way of overview, say that um, I'm going to be presenting key ideas from the book that Doug mentioned, Smarter Planet or Wiser Earth, how dialogue can transform AI into uh, collaborative wisdom. But I, I, it, it's a pretty big book, and there's a lot of ideas in it on a lot of topics. So I'm going to uh, glide over some of them with just reference, and we can come back to them and talk in more detail if you want. But I, I want to be sure to try and get to uh, stuff about AI in particular. Um, and you'll find that sort of part of my idea is that our civilization has some big problems because of, in large part, forms of thinking that dominate in economics and ethics and politics and in technology. And that it's helpful to distinguish between one form or set of forms that are monological in character. They involve uh, inferential reasoning of the kind we associate with classical logic. And another kind of reasoning that is dialogical, that involves interaction with others, provides, I, I want to suggest, the key to sort of dealing with a lot of our problems in ethics, economics, politics, and AI, and a new way of doing AI, one that was previsioned um, by Alan Turing when he, um, in 1950, in a classic paper where he introduced the imitation game um, and sort of the, what became the standard model for computers based on inferential logic. He also offered a vision, not just of the Turing machine, which we, has dominated thinking, but also what we could call sort of the Turing child. And I wanna talk about that as a model for understanding what's going on with these new conversational and dialogical forms of AI that since November 30th have been more and more in the news. And one key point that's gonna come up is that uh, insofar as we're, creating AI that's more like a child that's raised through socialization and dialogue, we have to keep in mind that it takes a village to raise a child and that it takes an ethical village to raise an ethical child. So I'm gonna start off with some stuff about the promise of their civilization, this distinction between two kinds of reasoning I mentioned, and then uh, get into some dialogical strategies for transforming AI, and finally end uh, with some urgent issues and, and a few proposals. And um, I'm hoping that we can have some plenty of time for substantive dialogue about those, okay? So, uh, first of all, here, problems with our civilization. Um, there's a quote by Gandhi that I uh, really love. I, I love Gandhi in all sorts of ways and, and I, uh, Doug's very warm and, and, and gracious introduction sort of highlighted that. that. But the, the quote is from uh, Hin Swaraj, where he says, civilization is not an incurable disease, but we should always remember that the English people are currently afflicted by it. And I've thought a lot about what that might mean. Um, our civilization is structured by ways of reasoning in economics and governance and technology and morality that threaten our species with ecological collapse, climate change, sixth grade extinction, and with pervasive injustice and the threat of mutually assured destruction. And with possible domination in our technology by superhuman machine intelligence or superhuman foolishness. 
and with moral relativism and the kind of annihilation of, of rootedness and meaning for human life. Imagine that an alien anthropologist from Alpha Centauri came down, arrived on Earth, and was observing all this. Her first note home to her advisor might be something like, a species which imposes such radical existential risks, threats upon itself. What are they thinking? And you can imagine her alien graduate advisor's reply might be something like, clearly their dominant reasoning strategies are in a profound sense irrational. The central research question should be, how are they thinking? So one of our most dominant ideas about how to think best is to try to think ever smarter in the sense that IBM articulated on their homepage on July 7th, 2009, had an ad for a whole new business program and plan that they advocated, the smarter planet. Bit by bit, our planet is getting smarter. By this, we mean that systems that run our lives, run the, the way we live and work as a society, why now? Because the systems of our planet are increasingly instrumented, more than a billion transistors per human each, one costing one ten millionth of a cent. They're interconnected with a trillion network things, and they're intelligent, AI pervading the systems, monitoring and managing them. And this all is inevitable. This vision for business of promoting a smarter phone, a smarter car, a smarter city, a smarter war, smarter battlefield is part of a vision that Max Tegmark and others have uh, as we're approaching what Tegmark refers to as life 3.0, where there's a form of life that can not only redesign its own software, but also redesign its own hardware and become super intelligent. It's a vision that um, Moore's law which concerns the exponential growth in computing power in various ways and in information technologies, uh, seems to be confirming uh, Ray Kurzweil's claim, or at least suggest some confirmation for it, that the singularity is near, the, the point at which there might be an, ar an artificial superintelligence that starts to surpass us in ways that we can't even understand. But uh, shouldn't we hold off on artificial intelligence until we figure out actual intelligence. I want to reflect a little bit on, well, so what is intelligence, okay? And a proposal for our purposes today is that intelligence is the ability to achieve or sustain or enhance one or more values <clears throat> in various contexts over time, right? So for something to be more intelligent rather than less, it's got to be realizing some value. It scores higher on some test. It, 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 it does something that you want to do better than otherwise. And part of the point here is, is that if there are no values involved, then whatever happens is okay. It doesn't make any difference. So there are no better and worse answers. So there are no more intelligent or less intelligent answers. Okay. So on this very, this obviously this is a very general idea of intelligence I'm proposing to use for today. Notice that intelligence is guided by values and it, it involves reshaping or adapting the self and the world in some way. And it can take lots of forms, emotional intelligence, social intelligence, physical intelligence, um, uh, mathematical intelligence, artistic. And in this sense, uh, organisms and biological communities may exhibit intelligence. And so may machines and other systems. Uh, that you know, if if a if an organism can um, maintain a, a temperature in its body, that's a value that it's achieving, sustaining, or enhancing, right? So the same would be true of a thermostat in a house. It's a very minimal, but still in in this sense, intelligent kind of a function. Um, now, notice that intelligence, in the sense that I'm defining here, doesn't require consciousness. And for a lot of the discussion today, I'm just I'm setting the issue of consciousness aside because it, this notion of intelligence doesn't require it. But also notice that this notion of intelligence can be partial, partial or limited. It can fall short of a wisdom 
that responds appropriately to the full range of values that we should hold in our, our, our context in the world. So contrast intelligence with what we might call wisdom, which we might tentatively define as a systematic intelligence that responds appropriately to the full range of values that we should hold in the context in which we live, okay? So wisdom, wisdom involves, you know, taking all the other things into account too, not just being smart about one. And artificial intelligence, you know, it's, it's created by design or artifice. Typically it's silicon based, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and traditionally it's programmed by a person or team, but actually it can be designed to use evolutionary processes, for example, to reprogram itself, or there are other techniques that modeled in some ways on that. So notice this intentionally very broad definition includes everything from a heat, th heat thermostat to the most advanced form of learning systems like GPT-4. That's the kind of thing I'm going to be talking about today. And in that context, we can talk about two projects in our civilization that are related to AI. And the first is the project of having an increasingly smarter planet where our idea basically extends capitalist rationalization to every aspect of our farming, food, mining, educational, prison system, et cetera. Ever better management. And one of the perils or dangers of that is, of course, that um, typically these narrow AI that are, that are doing this are managing only for one or a few values. So they may be managing the school, for example, in order to increase, increase reading scores and test scores on math and writing, but ignoring what's happening with personality development or community identity or other things that are values that schools serve. Or they may be managing farms just for productivity of soybeans per hectare and ignoring all the other ecological services that a farmland serves. And so be foolish in that sense. The second big project of our, our civilization that ever smarter AI is, is, is aimed at is to achieve some kind of singularity of an artificial superintelligence, which might, uh, it, the proponents hope, uh, provide us ever better science and ever better technology and cures for cancer and for climate change and so on. But there are, uh, there are actually two versions of what we could call the friendly AI problem that are associated with that. It's also sometimes referred to as the alignment problem. One, one problem is, you know, with this super intelligent AI, you know, is it going to be friendly to us? Or will we be like sort of the, you know, the ants at the picnic? You know, it may be, may not be hostile towards us, but indifferent to us. And if we get in the way of the picnic, we get brushed aside, you know? Um, that would not, from our point of view, probably be good. Right? Uh, but now that formulation, which is the typical one used for this problem, I think misses two sort of wrinkles that are really important. One is, um, it's not enough just that the a AI that's created be friendly to its creators or owners, because suppose that North Korea happens to create, or some other rogue nation, create a super intelligence first. You know, what we want is AI that's friendly towards, to the good, in sort of in Plato's sense, or in, in, in some, some very general sense. I, friendly to, to, to good things and, and people who are trying to advance the good, a just, peaceful, resilient earth, for example. So we want, we want to figure out how to promote AI that, that's friendly to the good. But then if we do that, suppose we're successful, right? Then a second wrinkle comes along, which is if it's really super intelligent, right? Beyond our ability to understand even, and um, is really pursuing the good, what's it gonna think about us? What's it going to think about the way we treat animals and ecosystems that we are destroying and managing the planet with mutually assured destruction as a referee for international relations, you know? So part of the problem will be how do we get to the point where we're worthy of its friendship, so to speak? Right? Okay, well, so those, those are kinds of problems that have led me to be thinking about AI in lots of detail. And uh, now I'm going to move into part two, where I'm going to talk about reasoning and what, how, what, what its role is and different forms it can take, and two visions. 
with some economics, with some illustrations from ethics, economics, politics, and then technology. So one vision of, of rationality, which in a lot of circles is really dominant. And I think historically, most people involved in AI research have sort of assumed that it's just, that it is what rationality is, is a model that comes from, uh, excuse me, from, uh, from formal logic and in its various forms it's taken since Aristotle really, who introduced um, categorical syllogism as the first formal system. Where, you know, you, in this kind of reasoning, you've got premises and you have algorithmic rules that get you from the premises to a conclusion, right? So the classic example is, uh, you know, that um, if all A are B and C is A, then C is B, that's that's the rule. And uh, the 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 argument that Aristotle used to illustrate this was, you know, all men are mortal and Socrates is a man. And so if we run this algorithm, we get the output or conclusion that Socrates is mortal, right? And um, that kind of formal reasoning became much more sophisticated as time went by and got used in lots more sophisticated ways. Euclid was a key step forward in that. And by the time he gets done proving theorems and geometry, you know, logic seems to be much more significant than the little banal illustration that Aristotle offered that I just repeated. And then Newton comes along and formalizes proofs in physics to explain the world. Um, and this inferential model of reasoning um, is monological in the sense that it starts from one point of view, one set of premises and definitions, and it uses its rules of inference to draw conclusions. So it can be carried out by a single individual like Newton or, or, or a, a machine, a single machine, right? Now, the, in the 18th century, this kind of uh, reasoning, because of Newton in large part, let me just go back here for a second. Uh, oops, because I, I skipped something here. In the 18th century, it, um, it came to dominate ethics as well as a lot of other fields in terms of thinking. So you get people like Jeremy Bentham and Immanuel Kant who thought, hmm, we should envelop, we should have sort of the equivalent of Newton in ethics. We should find the fundamental laws of motion, of, of moral motion, as it were, right? And then use those in inference to arrive at the moral conclusions about how we should live. And Bentham thought it was the greatest happiness principle, and Kant thought it was some version of the categorical imperative. Um, but they both agreed on what moral reasoning would be. It would be justifying choice using inferences. Okay, And this conception of, of ethics still is largely dominant in the way that a lot of ethics is taught nowadays and practiced by professionals in professional societies and thinking about issues. And uh, part of the way it's taught uh, is exemplified by Michael Sandel. And, and there's a wonderful video series on his course on justice at Harvard in which he, you know, he starts off in the classic way with trolley car dilemmas, you know. Uh, the trolley's coming down the track. Uh, if it keeps going on the track it's headed, it's going to kill five people. You're in a position to pull a lever. And if you do, it'll go on to the other track. You'll save those five, but the other one person will die should you pull the lever, right? And um, Part of the point of these kinds of dilemmas is uh, to illustrate the difference between, say, a utilitarian view where, you know, you sacrifice the one for the many for greatest happiness, or a Kantian view where you might um, only feel you can adopt policies where you could, you could really will it from the point of view of everybody involved. Um, but part of it also is not only to, to help people refine their intuitions about those, those key assumptions they might have, but also to practice their, their logical reasoning and inference, right? With, and this illustrates examples of how you might, you know, use premises to pull the switch or not, depending on whether you're Kant or Kantian or utilitarian. Well, so <clears throat> I want to get to another example that actually Sandel gives in the first class session on this justice course, where he, he says, okay, most of the students that he's looked at, um, been talking with, um, they are 
rep um, repulse, they're drawn to the idea that they can save five people by sacrificing the one. So they're sort of drawn to a utilitarian analysis in the class. So then he gives them a new example, which is you're a doctor, surgeon, you have four patients in need of different organs for life saving transplant, and a healthy patient is in the waiting room sleeping. Right? As a rational utilitarian, what would you do? Well, it seems like you would you would be obligated, according to the greatest happiness principle, to go in and anesthetize that healthy patient and sacrifice them to get organs to save the other four, one for the many, right? That's what he proposes to the students. They groan, they're horrified. <laughs> this is a, <laughs> a possibility. But one student in the in, in the up, up in the back row uh, raises his hand. And Sandel is excited. He thinks that, that this guy is going to advocate utilitarianism in this context, which can lead to some interesting debate. But what the kid says instead is, well, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't sacrifice the innocent person's healthy person in the waiting room. What I would do is I'd try to figure out some way to, to pick one of the four people that's going to die anyway. And, you know, set it up so they can sacrifice their organs to save the other three, right? So there's a big applause because the students think, wow, this, hey, this is a way out. This is wonderful, you know, another option. Sandel, however, sort of lets the applause die down and he pauses and he says, well, that's a pretty good idea. In fact, that's a great idea except for the fact that it completely misses the point of the philosophical example. And then he drops the issue and changes the subject, and, which is good pedagogical practice for a lot of folks teaching in the US because they wanna force people to confront their intuitions, right? Rather than weasel out of it with some third option. But, you know, in real life, wouldn't you want your student or yourself or anybody you're working with to get out of the dilemma by coming up with a third option, you know? Um, and maybe even that might lead you to a different way of approaching the, the whole issue, right? So this student back in the balcony actually is exemplifying one of the kernels of the kind of dialogical reasoning that I think is a real alternative, not only to the way we think about ethics, but economics, history, and politics, and so on. And it, it's dialogical reasoning. Uh, it's, uh, it's structured not by algorithmic rules, but by strategies that guide a process of reasoning of, of, of this sort of basic form. In the first step, you don't start with, with premises everybody agrees on, you start with differences and an encounter with another person who has other ways they even define their terms. And then you go through in the second step, sort of the pursuit of strategies of negotiation, problem solving, conflict transformation, and so on in dialogue to try and reach a genuine voluntary agreement. So you don't, you don't proceed from, you know, universe, uh, 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 monologically assumed premises to a conclusion. Instead, you proceed from diverse views towards agreement. That's the nature of this, this second kind of reasoning. And there are lots of strategies for it. The Harvard Negotiation Project's uh, getting the yes is proposed that, you know, one is to multiply your options. Another is to focus on interests behind positions, you know, find out why somebody might want the option they're, they're advocating for. Maybe you can come up with a new way to make everybody happy. Um, they, they also note that it's really helpful to, um, as they put it, separate the people for issues from the engineering problems. A lot of times, um, the conflict, you know, it's hard to negotiate because people's feelings are hurt or they're offended. And so thinking about how you can build a relationship may be an important step in the negotiation. Um, and then a fourth thing they emphasize is that it's, it's helpful to look for objective criteria, S objective standards that are independent of my will or your will. So we don't just go back and say, well, this is what I'm giving you, take it or, or not, you know, why? Because that's what I say. You, you can't get very far negotiating with that. But if you start to say, well, this seems fair because it's a standard that other people use, that it's embodied in law, it's part of the natural reality that we face and the ecosystem we live in and so on. Anything that's a researchable topic becomes a source of 
perhaps, of objective criteria in this sense. The, there are lots of other um, strategies and practices of, of, of dialogical reasoning um, that use variations on these four kinds of strategies, as well as others. What they and, and, and uh, the Harvard approach all sort of emphasize also, though, is, a, is another kind of basic rule, which I, I, would, I would call the rainbow rule in, as co in contrast to the golden rule. You recall the golden rule says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I think that's really a very egocentric, ethnocentric way of looking at the world. And in the end, it takes my values and it imposes it on them. I'm going to treat them the way I would be treated. I would like to be treated. A better rule is, I think, of this rainbow rule where you do unto others as they would have you do unto them. Where from the get-go, you're asking, well, how, how would they like to be treated? Okay. Uh, excuse me. Somehow I got, I don't know. I think my, can you all, my sh screen sharing got messed up there for a second. Here we go. Okay, you're all on board with the same screen? Okay, good. So, um, uh, here's a, some examples of books that, that provide ways of, of practicing this kind of dialogical reasoning. They range from, uh, People who like Paulo Freire, who've done it in third world contexts. Uh, lots of folks have done it at the international level, uh, in the contemporary conflict resolution that uh, Oliver Ramsbotham and other others offer as a as a textbook in this kind of thing. You can find lots of resources on this. Quakers in beyond majority rule are documented as having a particular practice for this. Uh, people who do community planning and work on wicked problems rather than just complicated ones. You know, wicked pro complicated ones being like. How do you get somebody to the moon with rocket science? And wicked problems being things like, well, how do you solve poverty or end war? And folks doing community planning stuff have, have worked on those kinds of things a lot. And, and these all provide different kinds of concrete strategies for practicing dialogical reasoning okay? that can be studied and can be applied in ethics and in economics and elsewhere. Now, I mentioned that this seeking objective criteria is one of the strategies that's used. And I think that this is a really important feature of dialogical reasoning. When you're in dialogue with folks, the, if it's genuine dialogue, then you're assuming that you might turn out to be wrong or at least need to modify your view in some way, right? And that there's some standard, something independent of my view and maybe even of my culture but certainly definitely independent of my immediate opinion that can be used as an objective standard to decide whether I'm right or not or how I should modify my view. And how can we discover these, right? Well, Gandhi, I think, came up with a methodology and I, it's really, it's not appreciated the extent to which Gandhi was an epistemologist. He was a moral epistemologist and his experiments with truth developed this technique of satyagraha, of clinging to the truth, that involved a method of self-sacrifice and, and self-suffering in which you could discern and demonstrate and defend moral truths. So the idea would be that someone might sit in on a lunch counter or they might make salt and get arrested. Um, and in considering doing that in order to defend their claim that they had a right to sit at the lunch counter or that their country deserved autonomy and, and uh, sovereignty, from the British, um, the discernment would come in because if they get arrested, they're gonna suffer. And so they're gonna think twice before they, they do it, you know? It really helps as a discernment process to, to ask yourself, you know, in, given the prospect of this pain, you know, how, sh how sure am I that I'm really, I've got a call of conscience here, okay? But, then secondly, um, this kind of self-sacrifice or suffering can demonstrate moral truths to others. People watching people getting beat up, getting arrested, suffering in jail, at some point may, you know, as Gandhi put it, have their hearts melt. And they may be, they may say in effect, oh, you know, these Indians, they really, 
they seem to have a sense of personal dignity. They seem to be like people like you and me. I and mean, maybe maybe they deserve to be treated with a little more respect, you know. Um, and then, of course, there are people who end up not being persuaded, right, despite that. And self-suffering, if pursued strategically and, and tactically in, in, in intelligent and wise ways, can also serve to defend moral truths through active resistance to oppression by making it impossible for, or difficult or impossible, certainly costly for people to enforce uh, Jim Crow law or to enforce British oppressive legal uh, systems in India. So these moral truths that, that were being sought by this kind of Gandhi technique, um, you know, it, it's, it's an experimental process. So there, it's not as though you sort of, if you're willing to suffer, then you know with absolute certainty that what you're willing to sacrifice for is true, right? Any more than in science, one ex, you know, no one experiment proves the truth of a theory, right? You have to be careful, cautious, skeptical, trying out lots of things over time. And if you do, then it may be that you can have insight into sort of emergent truths about things like the shape of the earth or the biological history of human beings in evolutionary times and stuff, processes and stuff. So the moral truths that are sought are um, uh, emergent objective truths that are rooted in independent structures of reality, like our biology or our history or language, or, or maybe even love. So maybe be worth talking about more. But where, uh, for example, the fact that we live on a spherical earth and are the kinds of biological creatures that we are dependent on the kind of ecosystem we are, that may lead to certain kinds of values that we can all share in, a, in some kind of emergent objective way in terms of safeguarding the integrity of the ecosystem and its resilience. Okay, so I've given you a, a sense of this, this contrast by focusing on ethics between uh, monological reasoning and dialogical reasoning. And um, what I would just suggest briefly is that um, in economics, the whole conception of rational economic man as a utility maximizer and of corporation as trying to maximize profit and of the country as trying to maximize GDP, those all embody and institutionalize this monological form of reasoning uh, in ways that are very counterproductive and lead to all sorts of problems like ecological collapse, for example. And that there's an alternative model of what it is to be somebody you know, living a, a life in the material world, which is one in which you think of yourself as a history maker pursuing meaningful projects and community. And the kind of reasoning that you engage in is dialogical. In the, just the way that I was illustrating all these books I mentioned before. And similarly, there's a contrast between the kind of thinking that's involved in realpolitik, which is to a large extent, um, in the way it's rationalized by people like Graham and Allison and others in terms of a, a rational actor model for the security state, it is a, it is, just, is a version of the, the economic man model and a version of monological reasoning using sort of calculative rocket science to, to, to maximize certain values like power, territorial control. And uh, instead there, there's, you know, in the realm of politics, we can as history makers be, you know, involved in communities that are pursuing, uh, you know, self-development through and, and autonomy through uh, Swaraj and through nonviolent action, conflict transformation of different kinds. And there's a lot to say about both of those, and but uh, just <laughs> note that they're there. And then also note that uh, technology, you know, is can be viewed in, in an instrumentalist terms that are very monological in character, where we're trying to promote smart systems. But it also can be viewed in a really different way, where we could be viewing technology as trying to promote a wiser Earth, not just a smarter planet with sustainable relationships and community through collaborative dialogue with all the forms of intelligence that are present, human, but also animal and even plant intelligence and machine intelligence. Okay. So I've got a bunch of uh, slides that are sort of about how to elaborate those economic, political sorts of models, but I'm gonna skip ahead. We can come back to it later if people are interested. 
and talk about uh, dialogical strategies for transforming artificial intelligence into collaborative wisdom. Okay. So to do that, I want to mention these two visions that Alan Turing came up with in his classic paper in 1950 on computing machinery and intelligence. And one is what is widely referred to as the Turing machine. Uh, it's, it's really kind of a fairly definitive model of, of the of modern programmed algorithmic computer that, that uses inferential reasoning. Okay. And it, it, in the way that people think of it, I, I think generally it can, the inferences can be deductive in character, sort of symbolic logic systems, but you also can, it also is sort of the vision behind um, computers that are doing um, probabilistic kinds of reasoning where the, the inferences are still, you know, from premises to conclusion and they are um, monological in character. It's just that you're using probabilistic rather than deductive algorithms. But there's a second model that he that Turing introduces just in the last uh, section of that classic paper. <laughs> guy was an amazing genius. Um, and uh, so to get at it, first, let's just look at the, the contrast. He, he, the, uh, the idea of the um, uh, Turing machine model, first one, is the idea behind digital computers may be explained by saying that these machines are intended to carry out any operations which could be done by a human computer. The human computer is supposed to be following fixed rules. He has no authority to deviate from them in any detail. We may suppose that these rules are supplied in a book, which is altered whenever he's put onto a new job. He has also an unlimited supply of paper on which he does his calculations. He may also do his multiplications and additions on a desk machine, but this is not important. So actually the, the whole term computer actually comes from these human computers who were doing calculations like this at the time that he was writing. And he, he actually lays out all sorts of really important foundations for thinking about how to, how to develop that kind of computer. But as I mentioned in the last section of the paper, he introduces the second model in a really interesting way. He says, and he's looking ahead to you know, 50, 70 years in the future developing these, these machines, which would be like nowadays. He says, in the process of trying to imitate an adult human mind, we're bound to think a good deal about the process which has brought it to the state that it is in. And we may notice three components, the initial state of the mind, say at birth, the education to which it's been subjected, and other experience not to be described as education to which it has been subjected. Instead of trying to produce a program to simulate the adult's mind, why not rather try to produce one which simulates the child's? If this were then subjected to an appropriate course of education, one would obtain the adult brain. He, and then he, he makes it really clear that this second model of a computer is not an idea of a computer as a tool that's programmed by a user. Instead, what he's really, he really is proposing is that it's a child that's educated in a community through socialization, through dialogue. So he goes on to say, it will not be possible to apply exactly the same teaching process to the machine as to a normal child. It will not, for instance, be provided with legs so that it could not be asked to go out and fill the coal scuttle. Possibly it might not have eyes. But however well these deficiencies might be overcome by clever engineering, one could not send the creature to school without the other children making excessive fun of it. It must be given some tuition. We need not be too concerned about the legs, the eyes, et cetera. The example of Ms. Helen Keller shows that education can be uh, taking place provided that communication in both directions between teacher and pupil can take place by some means or other. Right? And he goes on and says a number of other things to make it really clear that um, he, he's envisioning something that is in effect kind of robotic. It does, it has some kind of a body and it can act and interact in the world. And he didn't, I think he really didn't envision how, uh, how well we might already currently have ways of, of providing perception and, and action devices for robotic entities that, um, that might begin to enter into a classroom and interact. And I think he also didn't realize the extent to which it might turn out that kids would actually be interested in, in at least some kids, in interacting with such devices um, and not just making fun of them. Uh, so notice some key features of this Turing child. Um, has abilities to engage in dialogical reasoning and interaction. Has a body that's immersed in the world. 
It's able to move between formal object language and meta language standpoints to renegotiate meanings, assumptions, and proposals. It can ask the teacher, what do you mean by this? And well, suppose we meant that and, and to talk about it and to talk about not only things with words, but to talk about the words themselves in a, from a meta point of view. There's some sections which he, he's very explicit, makes that clear. Uh, and it also is in some sense valuing truth and capable of meaningful error. It can be wrong and do better. Uh, will it need to be conscious? I don't think so. In Turing's vision, it, yeah, I think he, his vision knows that it, it could do all these things and the, the consciousness issue would be an independent question. Well, so let me just offer a few examples of things that, that might begin to provide some illustrations of what this might look like. Um, one, uh, one is from a, a program I wrote in Scratch for kids uh, to play with. And um, it's a classic kind of dilemma in which uh, there's this bear that's gonna come and eat uh, either the prince or the, uh, the uh, paraplegic guy, basketball player, who are out in a kind of savanna place. But you, you can save them by driving the bus over to one of them and, and putting them on the bus. And Ethel, the ethical consultant robot, is helping you decide which one to save, because you can only save one. At least that's the initial setup, right? And kids are forced to choose in the classic trolley car dilemma kind of way. But then what Ethel does in, in uh, very simple block coding kinds of programming is invite uh, kids to, uh, to explain ways in which they might be uncomfortable with their choice and might want to want some different options and other interests that they might want to take into account. In other words, to start apply, applying these getting the yes principles to the decision and expanding the range of options. And uh, Ethel does that in, you know, in a very mechanical way, but it invites the kids to start doing that kind of thinking. It prompts that kind of like in an expert system sort of way. And then what Ethel does is say, okay, you've come up with some good ideas here, you know, third option, interests we should be thinking about more and so on. Uh, why don't you go back and reprogram me so that the next time you play the game, those are options, right? So this is the point of this is just to illustrate a very basic way in which very, very simplistic kinds of computer systems can start to incorporate ways in which they, they nudge people towards um, uh, dialogical kinds of reasoning. More sophisticated ways include um, uh, a, a, a variety that people are, 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 have been doing for a while now uh, in working with activists and communities. One of them is uh, Callisto, which was developed as a way for people to uh, let each other know about sexual harassment. So if somebody was sexually harassed and they aren't, they're not really ready to call the person out. They're hesitant to, you know, to go through all the, the legal or other complications that might involve. But on the other hand, if this person has been a multiple uh, perpetrator, um, they would like to get the word out and then maybe collaborate with others in calling them on their action and maybe prosecuting them. So the aim of Callisto was to sort of develop uh, an online system for doing that so people could do it safely but effectively. And in designing it, the people involved made a point of you know, involving all the sorts of folks who, were, uh, who had been victims, people who were counselors, as well as the AI programmers and so on. That was a sort of community effort to, des effort to design it, develop it, and to continue to revise it, right? Um, and the, the system on which they did this is one that's uh, referred to as GitHub, which is a, um, an online sort of, in some sense, open source kind of system where, where people can go and they can share a version of some program they think might be useful and then invite other people to critique it, to revise it, to develop other versions and uh, to collaborate. And this kind of thing is something that currently uh, uh, programmers use just um, very, very commonly. Uh, it's sort of standard, but there isn't a reason why ordinary people who are activists or who are entrepreneurs or who are citizens couldn't also be part of the dialogue in terms of identifying issues and revising uh, what's going on, right? And in fact, uh, you get 
uh, folks like the ones involved in an organization called Console that's been developing free software for citizen participation that's been trying to develop that kind of thing. And if you want to get a vision of what this might look like, imagine you know, a group of community activists working with uh, programmers to tr try and revise the way in which AI is being used in the school to prison pipeline. And, and try to systematically revise the way in which school attendance records are kept and consequences for detention are made, but also the ways in which um, 911 calls are processed by dispatch services and the ways in which uh, parole hearings are held and AI is used in those and so on. Okay. Well, so those are some examples of the kind of thing that I would be thinking about in the way we might have dialogical processes for thinking about AI. And here now are five strategies for dialogical approaches to AI human nature systems, okay? And I'll mention them briefly and may, would love to elaborate on them more. One basic strategy I think is to define our guiding goal as the pursuit of genuine voluntary agreements. So that's what you want the system to do. You want it to develop genuine voluntary agreements okay and how do you want the system to do that well you want it to use methods of collaborative dialogical reasoning and nonviolence. now those can include some monological reasoning you know you can if you're um trying to do to Im, 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 improve uh, uh anything that involves large numbers of people or food or machinery or whatever, then, you know, having a spreadsheet and have, you know, doing calculations can be relevant. It's just that you have, that you have to have this broader, more encompassing form of dialogical reasoning within which the monologues happen. Dialogues are sort of, in a sense, dialogues between people who have monological bits of reasoning to do. Then the third basic principle structuring this is that we should distribute the roles and powers of uh, various reasoners and people people, machines, and even plants and animals that are in some sense decision makers are involved in, in, in uh, determining outcomes in, in just and appropriate ways. And there's, again, lots to be said about that kind of thing. Um, but uh, we, we currently have a lot of AI that's, for example, being created in ways that sort of perpetrate a kind of new gem code, as Roe Benjamin has, has named it. And it's important to empower people to be in decision-making positions, uh, approving or disapproving uh, software and the way it's programmed and the values that guide it and the results and the data that are used in it and so on. Then fourth, a key strategy is to frame the structures of the relationships and the commitments that we're, that we're thinking in terms of the, what, what the AI system is not just as an AI system in a box. So a lot of times people might think of AI as something that's in a box like down at the bottom left-hand corner of this picture, right? Where there's there are these, these stacks of, of computer chips <laughs> doing stuff, right? But rather, you know, think of the AI system as, you know, like the way Google works. Google isn't just a machine off somewhere providing us with answers. It's actually a bunch of people who are all collaborating to help the, the quality of the, of the Google results get improved over time. And um, in the ways that AI is used in managing forests, you know, the AI isn't just the people involved and the machines involved, it's also the forests and the way in which the forests are adapting and evolving and various kinds of plant and insect and machine and, and uh, animal intelligence are all relevant. So figuring out what those are and letting each have its appropriate role. And one way to picture this is sort of with a kind of flow chart like I've got at the top right here, right? Where you might have um, a, a food system, you know, and various points where decisions are made and AI of some kind is used. And you'd wanna be thinking about how the plants and people and machines and so on are all involved. Um, this picture is just to reiterate that basic point in a little bit more graphic way where at the center is this food system, for example, that little green chart I had, but it's in the middle of a whole planet that provides the context for it. And it's really important to conceive of the, the system, not as an AI system, but as a human nature AI system, as a human ecological system in which all these different characters are playing important roles. And then fifth, I think it's really important to make the, these systems uh, as open as possible to discerning and engaging with emergent realities 
in emergent contexts. So this is something that historically AI has had a lot of trouble with. Um, Open-ended contexts, the, what's sometimes referred to as the framing problem, you know, has been a big, big problem for AI and the way it's been solved in the past often is to just sort of, you know, assume a limited arena of action. And in fact, when people are trying to get robots to work, one of the things they've done is build a factory that's adapted to robots. Currently, people are also trying to build roads that are adapted to driverless cars, you know. Well, that, that's a useful strategy in some contexts, but I think that the real world is one that's diverse and emergent, and we need to develop processes that include humans and plants and animals and machines that are, that are discerning and engaging with and adapting to emergent realities of different kinds. So that's a summary we can come back to if we want of those ideas. But let me um, now mention some urgent issues. And how am I doing here for time, Doug? Um, oh, we're, we're going for almost an hour. I'm sorry. Uh, gone. Yeah. Um, maybe I could just mention brief, briefly uh, um, that there's lots going on with chat GPT and AI. And um, I think a lot of you probably are aware of it. And um, I uh, would love to talk about a variety of issues around that. And um, uh, maybe I'll just mention that. Um, but I, let me let me pause there, okay? I, I think that that. Um, but I, I guess I would say, um, in terms of what's going on currently since November thirtieth, the the sort of onslaught of, of new forms of AI that are being used in lots of different areas. Um, uh, I, I personally believe that we have to be looking seriously at trying to, um, in some way, control and structure what's um, um, what's allowed and, and, and happens because um, the we're not we haven't arrived at artificial superintelligence, but we've arrived at forms of, of uh, AI that are going to have very rapidly enormous impacts in lots of different arenas. And uh, one proposal, for example, worth considering, I think, is the idea of um, restricting the way in which AI is funded so that it's not funded through advertising, but rather through subscriptions. Uh, so I apologize for running on at such length. I hope that you found this stuff interesting. and I really would look forward to the conversation, and I'm happy to stay as long as people want to. Okay. And I'm happy to go back to some of the slides if people want to elaborate on various points. Yeah. So, um, so uh, if uh, someone would like to take the lead in uh, raising a question or comment or giving feedback, uh, why don't you just raise your hand and uh, we see a hand right away, you can speak first. Okay, who would like to start? I, I see a question from Martha, should I go ahead and? Yeah, go for it. So Martha, you asked to clarify the significance of November 30th. That's when uh, chat GPT was released. And um, I, uh, it, it uh, is a form of AI that seems conversational. You know, I don't know how many of you have used, how many of you guys have used ChatGPT so far? Okay. Um, it's the kind of thing where you can plug in a prompt, ask it to do something, and it seems to respond um, in, in a, a conversational way. And you can ask it to do an incredible variety of things, write a, write, write a short story, write a grant report, uh, write an essay for your school assignment, uh, write a piece of legislation, uh, write a camp political campaign uh, ad. Um, and it's uh, people were really uh, quite taken aback at how effective it was able to do those kinds of things. And it grew in use extremely rapidly. In the first five days, it had a million users. Within a month, 
or two, it had 100 million. It's the fastest growing app, I think, uh, in history, pretty much. Um, certainly one of the, the fastest. And um, uh, it's now uh, a kind of thing that people can envision using in all these different contexts for running their businesses, for fulfilling their school assignments, for um, uh, doing uh, legal reports and filing cases in law and uh, helping to write uh, scientific papers and write code. Um, and um, chat, the Microsoft, excuse me, Open AI, which is the organization that created this, has uh, partnered with Microsoft to incorporate it in their search engine, Bing. And they're planning on, they're, they're in the process of releasing uh, versions of basic Microsoft products like Word and so on. They will all be making use of this. And other companies like Google and Facebook are fast on their heels to do a very similar thing. So in the next few months, you're gonna have this AI empowered kind of work going on whenever people use computers, basically. Uh, uh, I don't know about whenever, but certainly in a high percentage of the context in which they do. And um, there are some very significant problems with it. Sometimes involves um, hallucinating and making up facts and questions about the values that it embodies and ways in which it might end up being misused. That's sort of the, the short version. We had some other, I don't want to go on to length. So uh, Jolene saying, I think in the chat, I think ChatGP would return different result if it was trained in Wabnaki longhouse culture or Basque culture, for example, where getting the result that per perpetrate colonial ways of thinking, Prairie would be worried, eh? And we should be too. And I think that's a really very much to the point. It gets back to this point that I, I've tried to make in my talk that, you know, it takes an ethical village to raise an ethical child. And uh, right now, I don't think we're doing very well. Yeah, Spencer. Yeah, so playing off that point about needing an ethical village to raise an ethical child, one of the, the challenges that I run into with dialogical thinking is getting two lines of thinking or like two people thinking. Um, because a lot of the time when, um, let's say, I'm trying to reason through something. I find myself as the only person who's reasoning about it that I am like in contact with. So I might be exploring a, a, a big question on my own and then other people around me might be exploring the same question, but it seems hard for us to talk to each other. So a lot of the time we, um, in my experience, we mostly end up um, monologically reasoning by default, just because we aren't set up in situations where dialogical reasoning is going to feel natural. Um, and in a way, I even see this with myself when I, I'm just thinking on my own, because it's it's still possible to, to use dialogical reasoning just as an individual. But a lot of the time I find that only um, one part of myself at a time is willing to grapple with big questions. And so I get like one line of thought that's kind of running on its own, but then it seems hard to, to spin up other, other parts of myself to come in dialogue with that. So could you talk a little about how you see the transition to an ethical community, starting from ethical individuals or ethical, um, a smaller ethical communities maybe, um, but moving from monological thinking to biological. Yeah, I think that's a really, a, a really important question. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of things in our culture and our social media that encourage us to be sort of atomistic individuals, to think for ourselves, decide for ourselves, live by ourselves, go bowling by ourselves, and so on. Um, so, and there can be emotional as well as intellectual and other kinds of challenges to to do just what you're talking about in terms of reaching out to people who have really different points of view or even doing it with yourself to get yourself to be in dialogue with with, with uh, things that you feel torn about. 
Um, I think you know one important step towards that is um, to uh, develop some kind of spiritual practice where you can deal with the emotions around you know the, the trauma of past times when you when it's been hard and help you relax and meditate and be mindful and be open. Take some deep breaths. Practice a little more slow Zoom kind of interactions with people. That that kind of spiritual discipline is really important place to start. Sometimes it, you know, I've got a, a friend who used to always go running uh, for several miles before he went to uh, work on the warrant committee for his local town because it just it just put him in a space where he could listen better to people and be more relaxed about it. So there's there's that those kinds of things that are important. But then the second key, really key thing, is to find kind of an affinity group of people that you know that maybe differ with you some, but are also are connected with you some, you know, and that you can collaborate with because thinking dialogue is not something we just do on our own, you know, and we need support and help. And so, you know, if you really want to reach out to people who are sort of across the aisle politically or, you know, in a different church, you know, religiously or whatever, then, you know, finding some, some allies um, that can help you do that. And, and you can do it as a group can be really helpful. And that can be a project that you, you, take on, you know, you can, you know, form a little reading group or a little discussion group or a group that meets at the bar or a men's group. And you get together and you talk about it's so hard to talk to those people, those women or those men or those whatever, you know, and, um, and problem solve together on it. I don't, is that a little bit helpful? Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, that's the first thing to say. Um, and it's probably hardest when it's most important to do it. Yeah, Doug. Looks like you have a question or a comment. Yeah. Um, the uh, so um, wanted to ask you something uh, that relates to the ethics, the economics, politics, technology, AI. So you had mentioned in this dialogical way, uh, kind of uh, Gandhian satyagraha as mm -hmm. a kind of method and theory and practice or strategy. So my question, even in a dialogical context, um, as Gandhi formulates it, and as he knew, this approach involves tremendous self-discipline, self-purification, self-sacrifice, willing to suffer, uh physically psychologically in every way and uh hoping to melt the heart uh and transform the other so the question is especially for people who are oppressed in ways that you have mentioned uh by the dominant system in a dialogical way if the other people who are involved in dialogue with you and you're using this approach, they say, this is really an unfair burden you're putting upon us. We who have the least power, <laughs> at least freedom or the most oppressed, and you're asking us, you're saying uh, that we should assume a method and an approach that is so difficult. It's so much more spiritual, it's so much more demanding, involves so much more suffering than those who really have the power, who control the technology and so forth in society. So how do you respond to that, that your method involves applying a tremendous burden on those, in fact, uh, who are, in fact, the most disempowered and the disadvantaged, the overwhelming majority, actually, in society? Yeah. That, I mean, that's a really important question, and and it's, um, I think it's a hard one to answer without, in a way that that gets the the nuances right. Um, I th I think um, that you know, um, I, I guess the 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 first thing I, I just would note is that lots of of change. Um, happens with uh, with principles of satyagraha being employed but where it doesn't involve the, the level of sacrifice you're talking about 
Mm -hmm. um, and it, ha it happens in community building. It happens in families. It happens all the time. And Gandhi sort of emphasized the way in which, you know, most of the time two brothers fight and then they go back and they make amends and nobody talks about it <laughs> because love worked, right? Um, uh, but there, the times when um, systematic oppression is being practiced um, and, and people are, are really suffering and have, have been severely disempowered, then I think the um, one key thing is you, you, know, you have to look for allies and you have to look for other people to be in, intervening, you know. Um, and so it's... Uh, uh, it's really important for people who have some power already to be looking around and asking how, how can I share it? Mm -hmm. And who am I called to help? You know, um, that's, that's one really important thing. Um, I think uh, for the people who, who are um, oppressed, uh, then uh, I think that, um, uh, one of the strategies that Gandhi sort of articulates of sort of Swaraj, which is sort of building parallel societies or parallel government, where you try and use kinds of nonviolent resistance to not to persuade the British, for example, that they're wrong or to melt their hearts, but just to ignore them and to build your own schools and build your own hospitals and your own systems for legal dispute resolution and your own technology for manufacturing clothing. And um, in many cases that, you know, it's not, it's not always easy to just ignore them, but that basic strategy of creating an alternative system can be helpful and important. And it provides a way of gaining not only sort of sovereignty and control over your own lives, but, um, but uh, cultural autonomy that, that can be a really important sort of lever or empowerment for further action uh, for living the way people want to um then and then there you know i think that that it, it's fair to challenge gandhi that you know at some point um it you know uh is there a point at which um departing from nonviolence and using weapons of violence is justified and i you know i think that's an open question and that's, that's one of the things one of the slides that i didn't share but um that's important to reflect on. It comes from uh, Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan have written this really interesting book on uh, why civil resistance works. And they, they looked at the effectiveness of nonviolence around the world over the last century, century and a half or so. And statistically, they found that actually it's been more successful on average, significantly more successful than violent resistance against oppression. But it doesn't always work. And sometimes violence does work. Uh, they found that, you know, uh, nonviolence generally results in a uh, more democratic, just kind of regime being set up when it does work, when it does win. But it doesn't always. Right. And sometimes violence can, you know, so so it's it, 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 there's sort of an empirical question here, you know, as to, to when, if ever, violence should be used. And there are cases like, for example, Ukraine today, where, um, you know, it's it would be very, it's challenging to think about how you would use nonviolence in a Gandhian way to defend Ukraine. On the other hand, it's really important to realize that part of the reason that Putin is, is so adamant in trying to use violence and, and retake Ukraine, or at least uh, undermine it as, as, a, as a country, even if he doesn't gain it back within his empire, even if he simply destroys it, it will win something important for him because um, Eastern Europe was liberated by nonviolence. And it could not have been liberated with nuclear weapons or with tanks. There was no way anybody could have liberated East Germany in 1988, 89. And when it did happen, people like Henry Kissinger and other military theorists were, they were just, they, they were just taken aback. They didn't know what to, what to make of it. They had, they had no understanding of what was even going on, really. Um, but uh, Putin did because he was in East Germany with the uh, KGB, right, as an officer. And he saw it. He saw the power of nonviolence and he saw it repeatedly used in Estonia and Latvia and everywhere else. And he knows that it could be used in Russia and he does not want that. So the, the, the power of nonviolence is in, in part indicated by the extent to which Putin views it as a threat. 
And um, having a, you know, a, a nonviolent democratic regime in Ukraine is a threat to him because it's right on the Russian border. They speak a language very similar to Russian. They could be a role model for people within Russia. So he does not want them there playing that role. So a, a, anyway, uh, I'm, I'm going on to too much length on that, that point. But I, but I think the key point is that you know, nonviolence is very powerful. It can work a lot. There's no perfect guarantee with it. And I think we should have a, as an open question as to when it should be used. I think we should have a strong bias towards using it in general, especially in the age of nuclear weapons. Yep. But um, mm -hmm. so I don't know, hope that is helpful. Yeah. yeah, it was. I'm glad I asked the question because it gave you a chance to make a lot of very insightful responses. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, there, I haven't caught up with the comments in the chat here. Maybe, uh, let's see. Yeah, so there's the the um, self-driving car dilemmas, which would be, you know, think about at length. And there are ways in which we're monologic in the way we deal with other species as, as uh, uh, JB is made, John Jolene makes that point, why that I think is really important also. Um, yeah, and the idea that it takes all the beings to raise a child. That's a really nice way of putting it, I think. Uh, it's part of, part of I think, what I was trying to get at, but I think it's, what, it's, it, uh, it's really, really good. Um, and But in order to have that happen, we have to take care of all the other beings. We have to respect and honor and, you know, not take the first and leave the last when we go collecting things in nature, you know, so that nature is ready to respond in more intelligent and helpful ways. And M is, notes that the technological singularity was mentioned earlier. I think if, if AI trains AI, then we could see something like that, recursive self-improvement if chat GPT trains chat GPT. Yeah, I think we're, you know, um, there at, at least uh, to some extent, that's what we're getting already. It's one of the reasons for being really concerned about this stuff, um, because ChatGP is now helping people write blogs and websites. They're putting it's putting out stuff that's being used on the web, that will then be used to train other <laughs> other uh, generative AI. Um, it's also being used to write code. So some of the top programmers for uh, Microsoft and other other folks are eighty percent of the code. Eighty percent of the code some of them are writing is written by a generative AI, they're supervising it and proofing it. And uh, but so there are, it, those are important issues. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, copies of my book, it's, uh, if you wanna see a pre-release version, of it, it's, it's gonna be another six or six or eight weeks before hard copies are out, but I would be delighted to send copy of the book to anybody who's interested and especially interested in any comments you might have. Uh, we're also really looking for people who might be interested in writing a blurb for it or writing a book review for it or just talking with me about it uh, or, you know, talking with other folks about it. So um, I, I'll put my uh, my email in the, in the chat here. And I, I just, if you send me a note, I'll send you a copy of the book. Okay. And I'll, I'll also put my telephone number in case you want to talk to me. And as Doug mentioned at the start, you know, I, I'm quite open and would be very interested in talking to more people about all this stuff in more detail. I'd be especially interested, um, I, I'm, I'm interested in all this stuff, the economics and, you know, how do we as individuals make the transition from being rational economic man, consumers, consumers in the capitalist society, to being history makers who are thinking in, in dialogical reasoning. Uh, how, how do we do that? And I've got a bunch of ideas about that, but there are lots of, lots of others out there, and I think we need to be working on them. One, one key thing is we have to figure out how to cut our material consumption and use our income to be changing the world so that what we do with what, what we have as, as income is not create utility for ourselves or pleasure for ourselves, but we create changes in the world that we want. So we're, we're, we're doing stuff in the world with our money more. Um, the similar points would be applied to politics, but I'm also really interested in talking with anybody who works in, in AI and computer tech stuff about 
the details of this. I'm, uh, I've done a little bit of programming, but I, I'm, I'm basically trained as a philosopher, but I'm really interested in ways of sort of doing prompt engineering and dialogical engineering of these new generative AI systems, and also understanding ways that all the forms of AI that are running our school to prison pipelines and running our food systems and our military systems can be can be changed substantively by by collaborative teams where I, I guess one of, one of the things I would in, in terms of follow-up for, for you all I would encourage people to be thinking about you know as you try to reach out to others in the way that we were talking about with Spencer about um, uh, dialogue if you're a, a programmer try to get a relationship with an activist and if you're an activist try to get a relationship with a programmer and if you're interested in like the school to prison pipeline, you know, then figure out some piece of that pipeline, the local dispatch service that your police station is using, or the attendance um, thing that your school is using to, for monitoring kids and dealing with their grades and who should be put in detention stuff, or the local judges, what, you know, what kinds of data systems are they using and collaborate together to make some changes in that system. If that makes sense. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, we can. It just uh, looks like it's a minute till two o'clock. So let's see if if we take uh, one final question would be fine. Uh, does anyone have or a comment or a suggestion? Uh, who would like to? Uh, is there someone who'd like to uh, add something? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can you hear us? I think Avi has a question. Hello. Yeah. Um, what are ways in which we can keep educating ourselves on this AI realm and in local, locally, how do we make a change? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, <laughs> send, send me your email and I'll send you a copy of my book. That might be one, one useful thing. There's there's a book that came out about four or five years ago uh, called Life 3.0 by um, uh, Max Tegmark. And in terms of getting a sort of an understanding of uh, a lot of this, what's been going on in AI uh, and its relationship to political and economic issues from the point of view of kind of the smarter project, the smarter planet project, if you want to sort of understand that as a project, that I think is a very helpful kind of book to start with. Um, and um, then uh, I would note that there, that um, following uh, uh, now AI, the, the, some, many of these issues and what's going on right now in AI are coming up in the New York Times. Uh, Kevin Roos as a journalist has been following it. But so there, so that, that's, it, it's now in mainstream news that you can, you can look places where quote all the news that fits that's fit to print has fit so it's it's there now there's there are lots of um there's just an overwhelming number now of, of podcasts and other things that are out there um in, in terms of getting information about it um uh khan academy if you're an educator khan academy has started to develop an ai for educators uh track their 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 program um, and, uh, uh, if you're interested in doing some kind of local project, I'd be delighted to talk, talk and chat and brainstorm around who you might contact and what you might do for something like that. Um, um, but I, I think, uh, you know, it's, it, it, my experience has been to talk with people often that it initially seems like, hmm, AI, where, you know, I don't know, where, where would that be, you know? And then you start to look around and you discover it's all over the place. Um, it's in the way the heating systems are run in your building and the way your kids are being educated and so on. So, so starting with issues that, that concern you and then asking how, how, are, how are we managing that? Might be, and, and then talking, just starting you know, over beer or tea or on a walk, talking with friends about, about that kind of thing 
and then talking with the people who are in decision-making positions who are buying software, who are running it, um, and so on. Might, might be a good way to start. Um, yeah, Jim Campbell's mentioned the uh, uh, Last Invention by James Bratt, which is a book that came out a while ago, but that does, does really a nice job of <laughs> scaring the bejesus out of people and raising all sorts of important issues. Yeah, and I, I don't know this other one, Automation in Utopia by John Dyer, Donahair, but that would be, I look forward to looking into that more. Um, there's a question here, uh, Doug, that if, if this talk is going to be available on tape, yes. I understand it is, it is, and how, where will you post it if people want to share it with other people? Yes, uh, the program is being recorded, and then Alejandro uh, is in the next few days, he'll work on it, he'll shorten it a little bit, uh, and he then will post it on our Socialist and Marxist Studies website. We have a website, uh, the flyer, the poster that you've seen for the series and also for Gray Cox's program today, right on the top of that flyer, it has the link for the website. So I would say two or three days from now, you'll see the program posted there, the recording, and you can all, and anyone else can access it and use it at that time. Hey, um, Doug, can I mention one other, other thing for those who are sure. here lingering? Um, uh, in thinking about action on these issues, um, one of the things that has struck me is that um, he, those of us here in the second congressional district of Maine may be poised and positioned to do something really important in terms of it, political initiatives around these issues. Um, as I mentioned, um, uh, nationally and internationally, that you know Microsoft and Google and so on are going to be bringing out these. Um, AI enhanced versions of their, their products uh, in the coming months. And it's an open question as to whether or not we might set up something like the, the FDA to regulate uh, AI, or maybe enact legislation like the, the environmental income, uh, excuse me, environmental impact statement legislation that did a lot actually for environmental protection historically. Maybe we could enact something like that for a, these AI things that are coming along. Um, or um, maybe we could um, uh, pass a law that would just ban using advertising to fund AI. The, the, uh, to me, the idea that that um, that Facebook would, would be able to use these forms of, of uh, generative AI to help people make their decisions about what drugs to use and what what uh, uh, how to live their lives in all sorts of ways and fund that by pharmaceutical companies or others. It's just a real recipe for a nightmare. Um, and so I mentioned the second congressional district because we're purple. We've got a you know Republican senator, an independent senator, and a Democratic representative. And they all are people who, who are sort of in the swing zone in Congress and have exercised leadership in different ways. And this is a kind of issue on which um, some kind of bipartisan legislation might actually get passed because the issue is so urgent. And so thinking about how we might actually lobby them uh, and, get, and get together to do that is I think a really is a worthwhile thing to consider. I'd certainly be interested if anybody else is interested in that, please contact me, let's talk about it. I, I don't know exactly, um, you know, I don't, I don't have any master plan for that, but on the other hand, I know that People like Representative Ted Liu from uh, Cal uh, California are actively trying to figure out what kind of legislation, if any, could be passed for an FDA type thing or other things. So I think I think it's really timely to, to be thinking about that. And I think those of us in this district would maybe be called to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, I uh, want to thank. Uh, First of all, I'd like to thank all of the participants for uh, raising a wide range of very good questions and um, also good comments. And I'd especially like to thank uh, Ray Cox for very thought-provoking, very informative presentation. I learned a lot 
And um, so thank you very much. And uh, I hope uh, you can join us. We'll put out a lot of publicity for our next program because uh, Guy Standing uh, is not only uh, one of the leading in